So really excited, um, the last couple of weeks or last week I've been talking specifically about your words, the impact of your words. Uh, very important. Had somebody not taught me this, had I not read this from the Word of God, I would have not have believed it. Uh, I've, you know, from a young age in our culture, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you, right? And, and I never could believe that these words coming out of my mouth were shaping, they were forming my destiny, they were creating the environment I was around. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. That couldn't be proven by the scientific method. And so, yet I read last week, I said specifically that, that God's going to say that life and death are in the power of your mouth, the tongue, right? And your words have impact. They have, I use this word, weight, weight. And I said, you got to be a weight watcher. How many of y'all were here last week? If you weren't, go online, check it out. We have it on YouTube, Facebook, but very important because I'm going to build on that this week, that not only you need to be a weight watcher, but that your words, you need to speak winning words over wishing words. You need to speak winning words over wishing words. Now, what do I mean by winning words? I don't mean winning words like you're going to win a fight with your spouse. That's not... You're like, I can't laugh too loud. My spouse is right next to me. I don't mean that. What I mean is that, that your words would line up with God's word, that, that you would speak what he's saying to you, what he's saying about you, that you wouldn't believe some of the, the ways the world says, or, and you wouldn't live in this place of wishing that God would work in your life, but you would live in a place knowing that he's going to work in your life. And this is an important journey that you're on because every one of you, God has a specific plan for your life. I could show you in Ephesians, the second chapter, the 10th verse, that God has prepared all good works beforehand that you would just walk it out. Like God is the master architect and he has, he has drawn your life up in such a way that, that, that it's amazing. You, you're, man, you are a mansion. You are a, scripture says, a masterpiece. God's handiwork, his artwork. And he's... he's given this beautiful blueprint, but he needs you as responsibility, response of ability inside of you to respond to this plan he has for you by speaking life. It says that God framed the world by the words that he spoke. We, we look back at Genesis, right? It, God didn't wave a magic hand to have something happen. He didn't get a wand out. And that, that's how I would have created it had I'm telling a children's story based on the culture and how I was raised. Like, he's going to have Mickey Mouse ears. We're going to sing Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. And God's going to wave a wand and something happened. But that's not how it works in the kingdom. God speaks and then it exists. And then he creates mankind in his own image, meaning you were created both male and female in the image of God to be speaking spirits, that life and death are in the power of your tongue. And so it's important that you speak life, that you speak winning words over your life. You speak what God is saying about you. But it's more than just being a nice person. It's more than just speaking lovely words. It's about speaking the things unseen. It's about speaking when everything is going against you. There's fears that are trying to creep in. There's mountains in your life. And it's speaking no longer what you just see and feel and touch and taste, but it's speaking in a place of what you believe, the promises coming to pass. Y'all okay today? I'm going to preach a little bit today. I'm not going to teach so much, but you got to hear me today. And I do need some help when we get this thing going. So... So the beautiful thing is Jesus is going to teach this this beautiful parable about faith and what does it look like to have faith. And he connects faith with your words. Now why this is important is because the writer of Hebrews says without faith it is impossible to please God. Those that come to God must believe that He is, and He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. So God will speak something to you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing God's Word. And so God speaks a promise to you, and now the question is, can you tie your words to your faith? Uh, Back in Mark 11, Jesus Jesus goes to this fig tree, and I think it was morning because He says it's for breakfast, and he goes to the fig tree, it says it's the season for the, fig, uh, the tree to have figs, and there's no figs on it. And so Jesus just curses the fig tree right there. 
That's like you going to Whataburger and they don't have any bacon, right? Like how are they not going to have bacon for your burger? That don't make sense, right? And so you curse Whataburger. And then what happens? It just blows up right there because the tree, when Jesus curses it, it immediately shrivels and dies. Now that's pretty amazing, right? All right, the two people that are with me today. It's pretty amazing that somebody could speak words and it immediately happened without using Roundup. Right? And, and most of us marvel at that, like the disciples, and we say, wow, that dude's God. That's God. That's why that happened. But Jesus takes it an opportunity to not only show that he is God, but that now he's given us responsibility. A response now given to us, an ability inside of us, this responsibility to respond like God would respond in this type of situation. Look at this. In Mark 11, the 22nd uh, chapter, it says, Have faith in God. Now, uh, you'll see that word in. I've actually studied Greek, took uh, seminary, and had some Greek classes. That word in is actually possessive. Literally translated. Translators just got scared. Literally translated. It's supposed to say to have the faith of God. Have the faith of God. So what is Jesus saying here? He's saying, what I've demonstrated to you right now, the faith that I'm demonstrating to you, I want you to have. Now, th- now Jesus is taking it to a whole new level. It's one thing for Jesus to do something. It's another thing for Jesus to ask you to do it. But yet he's that amazing that he does and he gives you the ability. So he says, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have Whatever he says. Now, stop here for a second. I want you to get this because I kept on reading the East and I think they met, missed this. But look at this right here. It's going to use the word says three times. Speaking three times to believing just once. See, Jesus is trying to help you understand some things here. That a believing heart is a speaking heart. And so the first observation I want you to understand about your words and about having winning words and about getting to the promises of God is that you have to speak your faith. Notice the mountain doesn't move and then you speak. You speak for the mountain to move. Uh, it's, y'all know the guy named Doubting Thomas in Scripture? It's a shame because we all know him by Doubting Thomas, right? And Because Thomas, I mean, he shouldn't have gotten a bad rap like that. He should be Apostle Thomas, right? But yet, we all know him by Doubting Thomas. And why is that? Because he says, I ain't believe in this resurrection unless I get my finger and I stick it right into the nail holes. Unless I put my hand into his side. I guess he wanted to put his whole hand in there. I don't know what he was thinking. I would have never said that, right? That's just... But he didn't believe, right? He, just had, he was doubting. And Jesus comes to him and he says, come on, put it in there. That's weird, right? To just to think of it. That literally happened. Like He's like, put it in the side. Just reach in there. Move the skin around a little bit. There you go. Sorry, I'm just... The pastor, sometimes you like envision these stories and you're like, this is weird. But yet, I love what Jesus says after it, which is way more profound than sticking his hand in his side. He says, more blessed are those that don't see yet still believe. Why is that? Because faith is the place of the unseen realm. And that unseen realm only comes to pass with a winning mouth, a mouth that chooses to speak God's word. Now, had I not, had I not read this, had people not taught me this, I never would have believed it. I never would have believed it. Because I would be one that I'd pop off at the mouth. I, I had the gift of gab. I, like, I knew how to tell people when they were wrong and how they were jacked up. I knew how to, you know, you ever heard this? It is what it is, right? But the problem with that statement is there's no faith in it. I'm saying it is what I can see. and Instead of saying it is what I am going to speak. But that's what Jesus is trying to teach him there. And so we, I love this because in the scriptures we find evidence of somebody not using their mouth to have winning words. 
It's uh, Zacharias. Zacharias, if I put it in kind of our context, is a pastor. He's a priest in the, in the Jewish temple, he, but he's a pastor. He teaches at a local synagogue. And so he, he's been praying with his wife, Elizabeth, for them to have a child. And they've been believing God. They've been praying for this, asking God, bless us. Please give us a child. We, we want to see this promise come to pass. And, and, and then all of a sudden, Gabriel shows up and says, hey, I got good news for you guys. You're going to be blessed with a child. God has made this promise now. All the prayers that you've been praying have been heard and your child is here. And you would think that the pastor is like, I know, praise God, life out of my mouth, right? But he doesn't respond that way. In Luke, the first chapter, he's going to say this. And Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. Now, I got a question. Had this ever happened in scripture before? Where God touched an old man with a wife that was well advanced in years. Now, you think a pastor would know that this has happened before. He has an angel of the Lord standing in front of him, but yet he's pulling the Gideon. How am I going to know this, God? And watch what happens when he has a response that's based on wishing instead of winning. He says this, And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you these glad type, this joyful news. But behold, you will be mute and not be able to speak until the day these things take the place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Let me tell you what's happening here. God's about to send the Messiah, Jesus. He wants to send a forerunner, John, through Zacharias and Elizabeth. He wants to do that. And he says, man, we got to shut this dude up. Because if he speaks the wrong words, he's going to mess up this plan. And how many times do I see myself and God promises me something and I say, eh, but can that really happen? I mean, some of us, we feel like we're dumb and dumber, right? And they say it's the chance it's one in a million, right? But you've got to be able to say, so you're telling me there's a chance. The young people don't even know that joke. <laughs> Older people are like, you shouldn't be watching those movies, Pastor. <laughs> so, gee, it's, so the Lord shuts him up because he didn't want his words to mess up. The process of the promise. Have you been there before? Have you been there when Jesus said, remember in Mark 11, you can't doubt in your heart. You got to believe the words that were spoken to you. And what's crazy is the the, the angel's going to come to Mary and he says, Mary, you're going to have a child. And watch Mary's response, what comes out of her mouth on this. Then Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be according, let it be to me according to your So she got to, she got to keep talking. You know, it's interesting. She'll go see Elizabeth, and they have a little praise party in, in Luke, the second chapter. They have a little praise party, like, oh, praise God, like he's blessing us. Like they just, they rejoice together. And, and the beautiful thing is the Lord allowed Elizabeth to still keep talking. Why? Because her words were lining up with the process of the promise. Do you have winning words, or are your words wishing words? Wishing words don't receive the promise. Wishing words go back and forth. Wishing words are like, "Mm, I'm not sure that can really happen. I'm well advanced in age. I'm not sure you can really bless me, God, because I haven't had the college education. I haven't done the things necessary. But God's trying to tell you, I'm for you. I'm not against you. If you would just get this mouth to line up with my word. Y'all okay with that? Not only that, you got to stay consistent, consistent with this communication. Yes. Second observation, consistent with this communication. We, we get a beautiful picture into the spirit realm in Daniel 
uh, Daniel the 10th chapter. Daniel's praying for his people. He needs a revelation from God because they're in captivity and he's wondering when, what, what is the next step for us, God? What is the revelation of us being delivered? And so he prays to the Lord. He begins to seek the Lord and nothing happens for 21 days. And then on the 21st day in Daniel the 10th chapter, the eighth verse, and the angel of the Lord, this one, this time Michael, I'm using the archangels today. I'm going to even use Lucifer. Don't worry, I'm going to use you too. So here we go. It says this. Then in the Daniel 10th uh, chapter, eighth verse, then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. Now notice that that was the first day. And I have, be- have become because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to the many days yet to come. Amen. Now I love this because it gives us insight into what goes on when you pray. Notice there that God hears you when you pray. And He answers you, not at some point down the line, but immediately. Now that's really good because sometimes we hear, not yet, right? But maybe it's a not yet, maybe it's a spiritual battle going on like in Daniel. And so for you to back off and say, well, maybe I'm not supposed to have it, then your words get out of line with the promise of the process, and that's why you must stay consistent with your communication. That's a lot of alliteration. I need to stop that. But it's, but it's in this place that staying consistent with it and not giving up is allowing that angel that's working on your behalf to bring the answer. Because if you think that that when God speaks to you and says, man, I've called you to have that spouse, and and you're like, praise God, you think Satan's going to be like, all right, well, I'm going to just make sure that that spouse comes along right at the right time, right? There's going to be challenges now to that. He's going to introduce some doubts and some wavering. And so it's important that you understand that when there's a a promise spoken to you, there's a good chance there's going to be a process that you have to go through to get to it. We see this in James, the first chapter, the second verse. James talks about this process to the promise. He says this, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. What? That's absurd. Does that make sense to anybody here? That you would get happy over going through a trial, but yet that's kingdom thinking. So maybe we should think differently. Well, then how should we think? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces or works on, uh, puts to work for you patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be found perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I want to stop here for just a second here because we've always heard this and I preach on this a lot, but it's, it's pervasive in our church culture. Don't pray for patience because then you'll get what you're praying for. Now I want to kill this for a second Because James said, count it joy when you fall into trial. So there's something, obviously, that this saying doesn't get with kingdom thinking. Okay, there's a a disconnect here. I want to show you the disconnect. Well, the thing is, you were created to be love. Back in the garden, when you were created in God's image, that was the image of God. That is, God is love. You were created to be love. Now, would I take metal and I stick it in a microwave? Unless you want to see the light show, you don't stick metal in a microwave, right? Some of y'all looking at me perplexed for a second here. Just go with me for a second. You don't stick it in there. Why not? Because it was never created for it. And you were never created for yourself. Through the fall, we went after our own self-pursuits and self-protection and self-preservation. And we did all of that because of the fall and because of sin. But Jesus came to set us free from that lifestyle. He, kept, he came to create you so that you can be love. And I don't mean like Hollywood love. I don't mean romance love, although that's nice and it's fun. I love it. But there's a deeper love. A love that lays down its life for a friend. A love that would die for its enemy. That's what Jesus demonstrates on the cross. A love that is selfless. And when Paul describes this love in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, 
Go with me on this journey for a second. When he describes it, the first word that he uses to describe love, he says, love is patient. And so when you say, I don't want to be patient, you're saying, I don't want to be what I was created to be. I don't want to go through a trial. Well, why not? You were created for that. And so when you realize that, that ability to, because if you broke it down in the Greek, it's two words, suffer for a long time. Then when you're going through this process, you can stay consistent with your words because you realize it's never been about you. I feel like preaching. I don't know if y'all are getting this. I'm going to listen to this later and amen myself. That's all I'm going to do. My wife's laughing. She's like, you do need to listen to it. It's just... <laughs> so it's, it's in this place of being consistent in your communication through the trial. And what happens is there's pressure put against your flesh. There's pressure put against your soul to get you to doubt. Because James is going to say this. He's going to say, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and, if it will be, and, and it will be given to him. And then watch this, because I think he goes from wisdom to just however you ask God, whenever you're praying, to pray like this. But let him ask in faith, faith with, with no zero. Zero. I know a lot of preachers say, you can doubt. I'm a, uh, no, he says, no doubting. Jesus just said, don't doubt in your heart. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. That means you're driven and tossed by your emotions. You're driven and tossed by what you see. Oh yeah, God, you're going to bless me. Then the washing machine breaks down. Oh no! Then you lose your job. Oh no! I'm never going to... And then right out of your mouth, I'm never going to be blessed. And it's, it's like you were, you were good, you were going, you, yeah, Jesus is amazing. I'm blessed, I'm the head, not the tail. Washing machine breaks down. Oh, man, where am I going to pay that? That ain't, I'm not blessed, man, I'm snake bitten. And you're unstable. I, 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 one of the most challenging, and Paul will probably give me a big amen on this. One of the most challenging people that you pastor are the people that are unstable. And I love it because they'll come to you. The first words out of their mouth will be like Peter. They're like, I'm with you till death, pastor, till Jesus comes back. And when they say that, you just want to be like, no, don't say that. I liked you. Like, <laughs> you're going to go through a trial. You're going to walk over. Come on, you know. You feel like, you're like, oh, I prayed for you, Peter. I prayed, <laughs> right? And, and I love this. Usually when somebody says that, I'll say this. Time will tell. Time will tell if you're stable and if you can stay in faith or if you're driven by the winds or if you're driven by popularity or you're driven by what you're seeing going on. Or is this gospel alive in your heart? That's why Paul, when he writes to Timothy, he says, choose faithful men. Stable. Why do you want to choose stable people? Because stable people can get the promise. Unstable people, they get hyped up. They're excited. Woo! Right? Jesus is amazing. They're the loudest people. Storm comes. What happens? The heat comes. The persecution comes. They immediately wither because there is no root. Well, what is that root? Paul says this, that you'd be rooted and grounded in love. It's not that they don't have any faith. I think they have faith, but they haven't realized that it's truly not about you. When you realize that, then when you go through a storm, it doesn't matter. You can stay consistent because I don't care what happens to me. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Now, either Paul was a raving lunatic who was suicidal and needed to go to a psych ward, or he had a revelation that I need. Uh, they, they found a snake in Virginia in 2018, a copperhead that had two heads. And they, they lamented about this copperhead because it, it would never be able to go in one direction because both heads fought with each other in a direction that it should go. 
And so it, they tried to keep it alive. It would end up passing away. But its two heads kept going against each other. And that's the thing. See, Satan's trying to get you to be two-headed. He's trying to get you to be double-minded, unstable. And see, what, what's happening, and a lot of people don't realize this. I need you to hear me. He'll come and he introduces this thing called doubt. It's not your doubt. It's a thought that you have to deal with. I'll give you an example of this. We see it in the Garden of Eden, right? He says to Eve, right? And we see it clearly. He says, did God really say that you can't eat of this tree? Did did He really say that? Is He really God? Does He really know best? That's what He's asking here. I I, I love it. Uh, Not only does He ask you know, about the authority of who God is in your life, He'll also ask about the relationship that you have with God. He's going to come and he introduces doubt with Jesus. Y'all remember this? Jesus gets baptized by John. Beautiful moment. Heavens open up. A voice descends from heaven. Uh, Holy Spirit like a dove comes upon him. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Y'all got to come along with me. When I pause, that's for you to answer. (laughs) I'm going to teach you all my preaching techniques today, okay? So, so he says that this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Then when he goes into the wilderness, what is the doubt that's introduced? If you are the son of God, then do this. See, he questioned his identity. He questioned his relationship. And when you're going through a trial, that's what Satan will do. He'll say, does God really love you? Is he really for you? I mean, is he he really going to bring that promise to pass? That's what happens, and he introduces this thing called doubt. And what he's trying to do is he's got to get this mouth to speak that. If you don't speak it, then it's not yours. But the moment you speak it, then it was in here. Oh, that's too good. That's what Jesus says, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I showed you all that last week. Matthew, the 12th chapter. Right? So, So when you speak it, you own it. But if you never speak it, it's never yours. That's amazing. That should free a lot of you guys because you get some crazy thoughts like you're driving down the road and and you're like, oh, that would be 10 points if I hit that grandma right now, right? (laughs) Maybe that's just me. (laughs) And I spoke it too. Dang it! (laughs) So, so, forgive me, Lord, right? So, uh, whew, this is revealing confession time. All right, anyway. So if you speak it, it becomes yours. And the point is, you can't speak it. It happens with John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist thought Jesus was coming to establish his kingdom, set up the Messiah. He says out of his own mouth, he's, he believes the promise. Man, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I must decrease so he can increase. I love the message translation. I'm not even supposed to be a stagehand on this play. But then he gets thrown into jail... And it doesn't look like the promise is coming to pass. And he's got pressure against his flesh. And it looks like he's about to die. And he says, disciples, go ask him. Is he the one? Or should he expect somebody else? See, doubt creeped in. Doubt creeped in. See, my friends, you cannot allow doubt to creep in through these words. If you want to see the promise come to pass. Uh, there was a guy that was convicted of murder, and man, the case was pretty much locked tight. Like all the evidence was against him. Um, he was pretty much he was going to get sent away for a long time. And um, the defense lawyer came to closing arguments. He's like, "Man, what do I do? Like, how am I going to get out of this?" And and he decided to throw up a hail mary. He said to the, to the jurors, he says, the one that you presume who's dead in the next minute is about to walk through those doors right there. And all the jurors kind of perplexed and puzzled looked their heads at the door waiting for somebody to walk through and nobody walked through. And the lawyer said, see, I just wanted to show you that there is a reasonable doubt in you because every one of you looked at the door. He went back to his seat. He was like, feeling like Johnny Cochran. If it doesn't fit, you must have quit, right? Younger people don't know that joke either. 
Well, the crazy thing is, the crazy thing is, my friends, that the, the jury, they did not deliberate long. They actually came back out real quick. And when they got up to read the verdict, they said, he's guilty as charged. And everybody gasped, and the lawyer just got, the defense lawyer got up, almost obstinate in the court. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Every one of y'all looked at the, y'all looked at the door. There, there was doubt there. And the jury foreman, the, the spokesperson for the group, he said, yeah, we looked but your client didn't. See, there's something about being fully convinced that you don't even move. Think of Abraham. Abraham, it says that he was fully convinced that if he offered Isaac on the altar, God was able to raise him from the dead. He was fully convinced of that. And see, there's a place in your heart that, I, I, you know, that sometimes you'll have doubt. But it, it's not the problem of having doubt because a trial will reveal when it's there. The problem is when you keep it. Because I don't want you to be condemned today. There's been times in my life where a trial revealed the doubt in my heart. The, the thing is, I just didn't stay there. I said, this is not of God. I need to change. I'll give you an example. Um, I was living in an efficiency apartment. Uh, Y'all know what that is? It's just like a one room. It it was so small that I could roll over and cook breakfast in bed. One of those kind of places. (laughs) And uh, one of these days I was struggling to get to work. I was late for work. And I was working for my dad at that time, being a door-to-door salesperson. And my dad came over. And man, he... He knocked on the door, got up, I got up, let him in, and he began to just chew me out, man. Let me know. You gotta be diligent if you want to be blessed by God and all this. And and I just rededicated my life. And I was hearing these messages that I was the son of a king. Just kept hearing these. That's what they were speaking. You're son of a king. Expect the best. God wants to do the best for you. And and while my dad's chewing me out, I don't know if you've ever been, you've already messed up, you know you messed up, and your emotions rise up, and you so you just you just pop off of the mouth. And I popped off, I said, well, Dad, if, if, if I'm truly blessed, why am I living this efficiency place? I'm supposed to be the son of a king. And my dad in this moment, my dad in this moment said these words, and I, I remember it, it pierced my heart. He said, son, you don't have any faith. And see, I could have took that as a place of condemnation, but I took it as a place of conviction. See, conviction is beautiful because conviction allows for change. I had doubt. I didn't want it. And I knew I needed to change. And what's beautiful is I would end up going to Germany, being stationed in the military. Uh, I'd live in this beautiful bachelor pad in Heidelberg. The army treated me nice. It was so, I mean, it was nice. It looked right, right overlooked the city. And I was a stone's throw from the Heidelberg Castle. I mean, it was, that's how I got Marla to marry me, y'all. I was like, hey, baby, look at this. Please, come on, hook it up. And then we got married and moved into her place, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> so, so what's crazy is we're, we're about to get married, and we end up getting married in the castle. Just a beautiful thing where we were set it up and able to do it, getting married in the castle. And right before getting married, I'm praying to the Lord, just kind of uh, speaking with him, him speaking with me, and he drops this in my spirit. He says, do you feel like the son of a king now? See, he had promises for me, but I had to take when these trials came, this doubt would pop up in my heart. I had to take and get it out of the way. And so it's so important, my friends, that you grow in your faith. But then there's times, there's times that the mountains seem to be too big in your life. The depression too much, the trials too hard. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where like, you're just like, Lord, if you, like, if you don't show up right now, I got nothing. Yeah. And it's in that place, my third observation I want to give to you is you've got to doubt the doubt. Yes. We see this, we see this in a, a beautiful example with this team called the Boston Red Sox. It was 2004, and the Boston Red Sox were down... 03 to the New York Yankees, their, their nemesis. And, and it, you know, normally this wouldn't be a bad thing, but everybody, all the sports announcers are saying, man, the Yankees aren't losing four games in a row. This is the curse of the Bambino. Y'all know what that is? 
if you don't know what this is, see, the, the Red Sox, before they had traded this special player, they had won five World Series. They'd won, in fact, the, the first World Series ever, the Red Sox won. But then in 1919, they traded away this player named Babe Ruth. That's not a candy bar. It was a, it was a baseball player. I, maybe he was named after the candy bar. I don't know. Anyway, so they traded him away, and they never won a World Series since then. And the team they traded him away to, the New York Yankees, they ended up winning 26 after that, right? And so everybody always would say it's the curse of the Bambino. The Red Sox, they can't win. And here they're in the American League Championship Series, and it looks like they're about to lose. They, they, they should have done better than this. 0-3, they're about to get swept. And I, and I loved it. I watched it on a 30 for 30 documentary with ESPN, and I love, there was only just a couple of players in that locker room, but they were saying this statement, why not us? Why not us? Now, the reason I tell this story is because they would end up winning that in spectacular fashion. They would win the series, beat the Yankees four times, end up winning the World Series, break the curse. But see, they had to get to this one little doubt of their doubt. They asked this simple question, why not us? And see, you may be in a dark place right now. You may have people speak over you, man, you're snake bitten, you're cursed. There's, it'll never work out for you. Maybe it, was a, maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a teacher, maybe, maybe it's just been life's experiences, and, and everything in you says it's never going to be good for you. I say this, why don't you start to doubt that doubt? Why don't you ask, why not me? Why can't God good be, be good to me? Um, I love this. It was, uh, I just rededicated my life. It was 2001. And uh, there was this girl that I had liked and, and I was hoping, I was like, man, maybe this will work out. But the problem is she didn't like me. And uh, <laughs> some of y'all been there. Okay. So, <laughs> so man, I'm feeling, I'm like, God, can this work out? I don't know. And, I, and I'd prayed, I'd asked God and I felt like God was calling me to marriage. And you know, so I'm hoping this worked out, but she was just being friendly. And, and so we'd go up to, to church together. And I remember one time before going up to church, we were in a um, fast food restaurant, just kind of in their drive through about to get some food. And, and she dropped this on me. She said, hey, hey, Trey, you, you know why uh, most girls don't like guys? You know what the number one reason is? I just read it in a magazine. <laughs> and of course, you know, I'm pretty confident in this answer. I'm like, because they're ugly, right? And she's like, no. And I'm like, because they're stupid? Like, I'm just, you know, throw out the second one. You know, if it's not A, it's got to be B, right? She's like, no, that's not it either. It's because they're short. <laughs> now, she was maybe 5'7". And I'm 5'6 and a half on a good day. I'm soaking wet. And uh, so it, what, what's crazy is this doubt got introduced. And when this doubt got introduced, I started looking at my high school years and I was like, was that the reason I couldn't get a date? (laughs) In middle school and like, and I was thinking about college too. And like, is that the reason? Like, and so this doubt started to overwhelm me. Like, but yeah, God, you promised me a wife. Like, how's this going to happen now? Like, and I began to get angry. And I said, God, you promised this thing. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what this doubt says. And I said, God, I've heard that I can ask for attributes in my wife. So on my list, number one, she loves you. But one B is that she's taller than me. Because I want everybody to know there is a God in heaven. That's why I tell Marla, wear heels. Push that five nine to six foot. Let everybody know. <laughs> See, but God was able to answer that prayer because instead of wallowing in my doubt and wallowing in self-pity, I said, you know what? I'm going to doubt that doubt because I believe that there's a God in heaven that's bigger than statistics and facts and culture 
and can do amazing things. He could, he could take down a giant. He could split the Red Sea. He could heal the blind. He could raise the dead. And he's asking us, would we believe him so that we could walk in that same miraculous power? And so I ask you this simple question. Are you speaking words of life? Are you having winning words instead of wishing words? We all bow our heads together today. Hallelujah. You know, I never want to close a service without giving you an opportunity to know Jesus. While I talked about having words of life, you have to know the one that gives life before you can speak those words. And it's as simple as a prayer, but it's as profound as a life change. That the God of the universe would come and live inside of you. He's waiting. He's waiting for an invitation. Will you say yes? This is more than just getting into heaven. This is about heaven coming inside of you right now. This is about living a life full of His promises, His provision, His protection, His goodness. And not only that, you becoming what you were truly created to be, which is love. So maybe you've tried life and it hadn't worked out. Maybe life has been hard right now. Maybe, maybe you're at your wit's end. I, I tell you right now, there is one that wants to come and save you right now. And His name is Jesus. If you just say a prayer with me. If that's you today and you say, you know what, Pastor, I want to say that prayer with you. Just raise your hand high in there. I want to pray with you today. Anybody you want to say amen? Anybody you want to say yes to Jesus? Amen. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Come on. Maybe you've said yes at some point, but you want to rededicate your life today. You say, Pastor, if I looked at my life, if I took inventory, I'm not living right today. I want to recommit my heart to Jesus today. I'm the grandson of a pastor. I'd said yes to Jesus at a young age, but in 2001, I rededicated my heart never to be the same. If that's you today, you want to rededicate, just raise your hand. I want to pray with you today. Amen. I see those hands. Come on, He's for you. The cross says He loves you. Don't let life speak louder than truth. Don't let them hold you in your seat. Just raise your hand right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, you see all those hands lifted towards you. Jesus, we believe you died on the cross for us. And that you rose again. So we accept you in our life. We accept this thing called a brand new life. New new creatures, new creations in you. Old things have gone away. So forgive us of all of that. Make us new. Make us squeaky clean in you, pure and holy. And Jesus, we believe you're coming again. And God, you're more than a God now. You're our Father. Teach us, guide us. You're not an earthly father that's evil. You're a heavenly father that gives good gifts to your children. So teach us to think that way. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fill us. Fill us with your strength. Take out every empty room. Clean every empty room where we can put a no vacancy sign on us. We'd be completely sold out for you. We're not trying this. We commit to it today. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. If you prayed that simple prayer with me, you are brand new in the kingdom of God. It says, old things have passed away. All things have become new. So I just want to encourage you with two words today. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're in the family of God. <laughs> Hallelujah.